Okay, here we're going to do a real brief video, talk about uh, the bond markets and how we determine a bond's yield, right? So this is where we start thinking about, you know, actually how, how to value a bond. So I'll tell you what, I, I, I want, want to talk a little bit about default risk at the end, so let's talk about bond markets first. So the first thing to realize is bond markets, uh, well, to understand the structure of bond markets, uh, keep in mind, uh, there are... Many, for any company, there's a lot of different types of bonds, right? So when we look at a stock for Intel stock, there's, you know, there's one traded stock. So when, when, when you buy and sell the stock, uh, everyone's trading in the same thing. But when you look at Intel bonds, I don't know, maybe they have 20, 30 bonds outstanding. So uh, the, the, the trading in bonds tends to be much more thin than the trading in stocks. The overall volume in dollars of bonds uh, traded is more, can be more um, than, than stock. It's just that... When we talk about bond volume traded, uh, this is spread thinly across a lot of different bonds, maybe, you know, like say 30 different Intel bonds. Whereas when we look at trading in stock, it's all concentrated in, in common stock. Remember, common stock for Intel is just a residual claim on Intel's earnings. So uh, there's one type of common stock, you know, uh, could be different, different, you know, uh, different classes for voting rights and so forth. But the idea is there's one traded common stock. So knowing that, that'll allow you to understand the structure of markets, of bond markets and why, why they are the way they are, because there's thin trading. So it doesn't lend its, bond trading doesn't lend itself nicely to an organized exchange, right? So whereas stock is traded on an organized exchange, uh, where we have good visibility in transactions and so forth, uh, bond markets are OTC, they're over the counter. And if you don't know what this means, what it means is basically, uh, you, if you wanted to trade a bond, you just, you know, it, a while ago, you would call up a bank and say, uh, what's, what's your, uh, what are you offering Intel, you know, this bond at me? You know, maybe it might be the 10-year callable, you know, uh, but you, you'd have a unique identifier, QCIP for the bond. So you'd say, what's, uh, what are you, uh, what are you uh, offering this bond at? So you would call different banks, and, and each bank would quote you a bid and ask, right? Now, of course, in OTC markets, all the bids and asks and banks are, will show up on your, you know, on, on your terminal. Uh, however, uh, the idea of an OTC market is, depending on who you are, you know, you'll get different quotes from different banks, and there's no centralized reporting. So, whereas, whereas a on an organized stock exchange, right, in our national market system, I can look at here's the bid and ask on all these different exchanges, and over across all these exchanges, here are the best bid and the best ask. Whereas it's different in, a, in an OTC market, you just have a bunch of dealers, right, which are banks, uh, and they are just giving you bids and offers, and, and um, but they're not aggregated in any way to sort of a centralized tape, a centralized exchange. So the idea, OTC market, you just different banks, dealers are posting bids and asks. So and we talked about thin trading, right? The last thing to know is uh, just how bonds, uh, the, how the, the bond prices are quoted. Uh, so, in other words, if you were to actually buy a bond, you would, you know, enter in the price, uh, and um, the price of bond is, is a percent of par. So, if we're looking at bond prices, uh, you know, on a terminal, uh, if we're looking at a treasury bond, we might see something like this, one o one colon sixteen. If this was a treasury bond, a ten-year treasury note, maybe. So what this means is 101 and 16 30 seconds percent of par. Uh, the you're just supposed to know this is 16 out of 32, right? Uh, bond treasury markets are old, so we have old ways of quoting prices. So what this basically means is 101.16 divided by 32 percent of par. 16 divided by 32 is 0. 0.5, so there's 101.5% of par. Par value is 1,000, so all we have to do, I mean, so, you know, to do this, if this is in percent, you would move this over to 1.015 and then multiply it by 1,000, which has the effect of moving it back over three, so just move the decimal place over one. Uh, and this, what this implies is the bond is $1,015. Uh, $1, so that's how we, we quote treasury bonds. Note, you know, 16 out of 32, uh, 32, you know, might, that number might have meaning for you. Back when uh, 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 money was, was uh, gold, right? Uh, uh, so, you know, you'd have a coin, break it in half, uh, break those in half, it'd be halves, uh, fourths, eighths, sixteens, 30 seconds, right? Um, so it's kind of where we're getting this. Um, now, 
Corporate bonds are quoted differently. Corporate bonds, well, they're quoted the same way. They just don't use the 32nd convention. So a corporate bond, this, you know, would just be 101.5. Then you still have to know its percent of power. So again, 1,015. So instead of having the colon 16, they just they, they drop that and they put the, the 0.5. Last thing, it's you know we're talking here from a, from an intro to corporate finance course, so it's not important. But you you may see some people when, when you're trading a bond, uh, you're trading the clean price. Uh, but when you actually the transaction goes through, you, it's uh, uh, it goes through the dirty price. The dirty price uh, takes into account accrued interest. So the idea here is if you buy a bond, uh, but you know, there's there's twenty dollars of accrued interest, right? When you actually when the transaction goes through, you're going to pay twenty dollars more per bond for that accrued interest, right? Ah, uh, not important here. Okay, so now a, a little bit uh, of bond markets and uh, the just the, the bond quotes. Let's talk about how we start to think about what the yield on a given bond should be. So we start. So the way we find the yield on a corporate bond is to just basically uh, compare that bond to uh, a treasury, right? So we, let's build this up. So we first have uh, the, the pure time value of money. This is called the term structure of interest rates. So the term structure of interest rates is going to be uh, the yield to maturity on the bond, and it's going to be maturity here. But these are all zero coupon bonds, right? So you know this would be uh, the term structure. This is the yield on maybe a one month zero. This is the yield on one year zero, right? So we're talking about. So this is the pure time value of money, right? Um, again, there's zeros. So you buy this bond, you're guaranteed that yield to maturity. If you remember from earlier videos, buying a coupon bond, you're not actually guaranteed uh, the the um, the uh, yield to maturity. You know, if this is like a five, ten year bond. So the term, pure term, the term structure of interest rates will give us the pure time value of money. From that, and well, let's say the term structure of interest rates is a function of uh, inflation, the real rate, uh, and the amount of interest rate risk in a um, in a particular in a in a particular bond. So the idea is remember, the farther we go out, the more interest rate risk. Right? So it's a function of how far out here and how much interest rate there is. Right? Uh, and then it's also a function of the amount of, so this is particular to kind of like the bond we're looking at, uh, or a particular point on the, on the term structure. And then we also have um, inflation, and this is actually inflation expectations over that same interval in the term structure. So, you know, over, if it's a two-year bond, inflation expectations over the next two years. Uh, and also the expected real rate uh, over the next, if it's, again, a two-year, sorry, two-year note, it would be the, um, you know, what would, what would determine, let's say this point is two years, right? What determines the rate here is inflation expectations over the next two years, expectations of the real rate over the next two years, and the amount of interest rate risk in a two-year note. Uh, so we, we have this relationship kind of formalized in the Fisher effect. So uh, this, is, this would be uh, the nominal rate, one, so this would be the rate on the two-year note, right? Uh, and then we have real rate and inflation. So you can see from this, you know, real rate goes up, then the rate on, you know, the, the, the nominal rate will go up the rate on the two-year note. Inflation expectations go up, uh, the rate uh, uh, on the two-year note goes up, just using two years as an example. Uh, so this kind of gives us a formal relationship. Uh, then, once we have this term structure of interest rates, we can get something called the yield curve. Now, going into this a little bit, the Treasury does not sell um, well, and, and I, I should say, and I, uh, uh, this term structure of interest rates, these zero coupon bonds, they're made out of treasuries, so they have no default risk. So keep in mind, up until now, we're, we're, there's no default risk, right? So what happens is the treasury sells bonds, and then these primary dealers, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, and, and all, they take these bonds and they strip them apart into interest and principal, and they sell these individually. So think of, uh, I take a two-year note, and it's got 50, um, uh, $50 uh, coupon payments, right? So uh, what I can do um, is I can buy uh, 20 of these, right? So then uh, 20 of these bonds, it's gonna give me, in the first year, it's gonna give me $1,000 in interest payments, right? In the second year, it's gonna give me uh, $1,000 in interest payments, and then in the uh, second year, it'll also give me $1, 000, uh, 20,000 in principal. So what I do is I sell this $1,000 of interest payments in the first year, I sell it as a one-year zero coupon bond, right? And then do similarly for the um, for for the second year and for the principal. So the idea here is 
I, I strip these things apart and I, and I create zero coupon bonds. So, so these things, because they're made out of treasury, uh, treasury securities, they have no default risk. So that's, that's, like I said, that's the term structure of interest rates. Now there's a different thing, and that's called the yield curve. And the yield curve is just the rate on a one-year treasury note, two-year treasury note, three-year treasury note, up to you know, anywhere from a, from a one-month bill to a 30-year bond. So the yield, the yield curve is not the same thing as the term structure of interest rates because the yield curve are coupon bonds. And as we know, if you buy a 10-year um, uh, uh, coupon bond, right, at some yield to maturity, you're not guaranteed that because of reinvestment risk. So it's a little bit different. However, as far as we're concerned, we can use the term structure of interest rates and the yield curve interchangeably. Then what I can show you in other classes, we talk about much more about this in financial institutions. Uh, but given the term structure, I can value treasury bonds by arbitrage, meaning I can tell you the treasury, this treasury note has to trade for this if I can trade in all these zero coupons because I can reconstruct the, you know, in other words, J.P. Morgan stripped it apart, but I can put the thing back together. And the price at which I put the thing back together has to be the price of the, the treasury bond in the market. So let's talk, we'll c consider the yield curve and term structure of interest rates the same. Right. So then, you know, what we have here, uh, we have the terms, we have the yield curve, how we price a corporate bond or or uh, or municipal bond or so forth is we price it relative to this yield curve. Right. So what we do is we say, OK, well, you know, the price of it, a, a one, a two year treasury note uh, or the yield of it, I should say, let's say is four uh, percent. Uh, right. Then if I have a particular corporate bond, I just adjust it. I say, OK, well, I'm starting with four percent. And then, well, this bond has a little bit of default risk. So I add a little bit for the fact that this bond may default. So now maybe the corporate bond is 4.5%. But also corporate bonds have a little bit worse tax status than treasuries. So then I increase it maybe to 4.7%. And then it's less liquid. So maybe I increase it to 5.1%. So what I'm doing is I'm pricing the corporate relative uh, to, the, to the treasury security of the same maturity. Right? Uh, so what I do is I basically adjust uh, the yield for uh, the differential uh, default rate, tax status, and liquidity of this particular corporate bond, uh, so um, uh, relative to, to, to the treasury bond. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't always add, like, for example, municipal bonds, I will usually reduce. So if you have a, a, a municipal bond that has a better tax treatment if you're in the same state, you know, assuming you're getting the full benefit of the municipal bond, um, so that would lower the yield relative to the to the treasury. So the municipal bond may have a little bit more, it may have some default risk, so that the yield gets adjusted up, but the tax status is a huge effect. So you know, you, so that's why you can get municipal bonds less than treasury. So I want to make sure you, you know we're not always adjusting upwards. Now, so and again, uh, so we adjust the the yield curve for for a particular bond, a price of a particular bond. We, we uh, adjust its yield relative to the yield to, to the yield curve at the same maturity. And we adjust it for default risk, tax status, and liquidity. Liquidity, if I haven't mentioned, remember that's the fact that it may be more thinly traded than a treasury. So the idea, if this is really thinly traded, uh, you have to give me um, uh, uh, more. Uh, you know, you have to give me more to hold this, right? Because it's going to be harder to sell. So you, uh, the less liquidity, the higher the yield. Note in here, because I'm saying I'm taking a corporate bond at the same time to maturity than the than the treasury bond, that's that's what's you know that's controlling for um, inflation, real rate, and interest rate risk. Good. The last thing to talk about here is just where we get a measure of default risk. This is uh, from bond ratings, right? So uh, you know this is where bond ratings come in. So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, you might say, well, you know, how do you know if if how do you know to adjust the default risk? I think I did it by 0.5%, right? 50 basis points. So, so how do you know to uh, uh, go 50 basis points over 4%? Well, so what you do is you say, okay, well, maybe this is a triple B. If it's rated triple B, I just look at similar triple Bs and say, okay, so triple Bs are trading for 50 basis points over treasuries out at two, uh, at two years. So I'll use that same adjustment. That's generally how you do it. So this is where bond ratings become important. Um, is you will you will generally adjust for similar bonds of similar bond you know of similar ratings right now keep in mind bond ratings are not often not that accurate so this can be a little tough um, the, you know improving bond ratings are a uh, so this is where you go to what, which are now called NRSROs nationally recognized statistical rating organizations 
and you, um, so if, if I have a bond, let's say, um, you know, Intel, right, I go and say, hey, rate my bond so that I can trade it so that I can sell it to the public, and they will rate my bond. But these bonds, these ratings have historically not been so accurate. You know, the problem here is I'm asking you to rate my bond, so I'm paying you to rate my bond. Well, so now we have an issue where the, the person, the cust, you know, because now I'm paying you, uh, you have an incentive to give me a higher rating, otherwise I won't give you future business, right? So, so uh, getting a better, having a better measure, measure of default risk in bond ratings by you know, changing the structure of bond ratings is sort of an active area of policy making. So if you're ever when looking for open problems in you know, sort of finance and public policy, having better bond ratings are, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, we're, we're constantly thinking about um, ways to do that. Uh, to give you an idea, you know, here's the interesting thing. Uh, bond ratings, uh, to, when, when NRS arose, uh, they had access to a lot of data. So sometimes when uh, bond, people in the market won't pay too much attention to bond ratings until, you know, the bond rating is lower than we expect. So then we say, okay, they, they, they saw something that, um, that uh, uh, so often they don't really matter unless we see, you know, they're, they're much, they're, we see an anomaly, they're lower than we expect. And then we go, oh, no, the, the rating agency knows something. But in terms of this class, the idea of the way we use, so I, you know, I could talk for an hour about bond ratings and I want to, but I'll, I'll cut it off here. The idea here is we just, if we have a bond, it's rated triple B, we just go out and say, okay, we can look at an index to say triple Bs are trade for this many basis points over treasury, so we just apply that to our bond, right? Uh, and then tax status is simple, um, because again, you know the tax status, and then you just, the liquidity adjustment is a little bit difficult, but we adjust for liquidity. Last thing I'll say here, is that this yield curve, right, is pretty interesting. You can use it to predict uh, recessions and so forth. I have other videos and lecture notes on that. So if you're interested in, in uh, looking at these and, and realizing how they affect, uh, how they may predict what's going to happen in the economy, uh, take a look at those videos or lecture notes. Uh, otherwise, have a great day.